Hello, I'm Melinda Gainsford Taylor. When I first met the subject of tonight's program, she was a 16 year old runner on this very track, showing so much promise with her incredible talent. Jana Pittman went on to become two time world champion in the 400 meter hurdles, but fame wasn't always kind to her. Nevertheless, Jana in her post athletic life has followed her dream of becoming a doctor had a family full of surprises, and it seems that the wheel of public opinion has turned in her favour. When it comes to living life, I would say that Yana is in the fast lane. So we might actually make a start, so just as a reminder, guys. We'll She's still studying. Yeah. She's doing a PhD. So thanks again for joining us. This is our last session for our series of workshops, the AGI Essentials. This is the 10th one. I have been astonished at times to watch some of her online tutorials. We are here in this meeting. We're going to talk about the Human Research Ethics Committee. If you're interested Unlike in most mere mortals who watch these tutorials at normal speed, Yana is watching them at two or three times normal speed. It's just a blur to me. I can't hear it nor understand it. She remembers everything word perfect. I just love challenges. I feel like I've lived five lives already in my 38 years on this planet. There's some definitely drama associated to my early career. The tragedies, the triumphs, the failures. I've had many failures in life, and I guess I wore my heart on my sleeve and was very, very open with the public about how I felt. We'll just have a listen. Yana's energy and determination as an athlete is equaled by her energy and determination as a doctor. It's running away from us. Yeah. She is tackling medicine with the same gusto that she attacked the hurdles. Away fair start by Yana. Here comes Yana Pippen on the inside. Pashoka is stopping. Yana Pippen rushes to her. Yana Pippen's going to win the World Championship. What a performance. What a victory. Yana was fearless. Absolutely fearless. She was prepared to put it on the line early in races. And that gave Yana an opportunity to destroy the opposition and destroy them she did. Here she goes. Is this going to be a second world championship? Yes, it is. She had all the credentials and all the ability, both mentally and physically, to be an Olympic champion. It's extraordinary in a way that she didn't get a chance. I definitely feel like I have some kind of curse with the Olympic Games. I've, I love the Olympics. I loved watching it as a child and obviously dreamed of putting on the green and gold for Australia since I was like eight or nine years of age. But that elusive Olympic gold medal it always evaded me. I did give everything I had, but you certainly lie in, in bed at night and wonder what else you could have done to make that happen. In fact, in almost 10 years out of my athletics career, I still, I still feel that pain. She was um, deprived of the opportunity of absolute immortality in this country. She certainly was good enough, but she was a polarising character, I guess, um, because she wasn't embraced by everybody, but anyone that knows anything about athletics and sport realises that she was quite a talent um, from a very early age. When I was quite young, I fell more in love with sport because of the feeling of being a completely different person on the athletics track than I did being the dorky girl at school who studied all day. At school, I didn't have a huge social network, whereas sport gave me this completely different identity. One thing I do remember about Yana at school is that nobody wanted to run against her at the athletics carnivals. She was just far too good. And I think it was, it was only a question of time before she made a name for herself in athletics. At 15, she won the uh, World Youth 400 Hurdles Championship in Bidgosh. In the back of her mind, though, I, I think she always had the, um, the love and the, the need to go into the medical field. Right from when she was about four or five, Yana wanted to be a doctor and I could see that because she'd go around with this leather bag full of equipment, you know, like the stethoscopes and things like that and her dollies would all be, you know, 
the little patients that she had to look after. I love helping people and I love blood, which helps and gore and yucky stuff. So uh, I think it sounded like a, a lovely pathway. But in the lead up to the Sydney Olympic Games, absolutely out of nowhere, I ran this time which was way better than I'd ever run. And all of a sudden to be at the Olympics as an athlete was on the cards. It was, it was extraordinarily unexpected. Uh, shocked everyone in my family and my friends. At the Olympics in Sydney, 17 years of age, she runs in a heat of the 4x400 metre for Australia alongside Nova Paris and Tamsin Lewis and, and Susan Andrews. And she runs extremely well. And you thought, boy, Yana Pittman, this is going to be a name to watch. And all of a sudden, you start thinking about this might actually be your life career. The idea of being a doctor was completely sidelined by then. Yes, by then it was what am I going to do next? And I just think it made her hungry to think the next Olympics is going to be mine. She's an incredibly driven person and almost unnaturally driven sometimes. You can't quite do that that you do on the beer ones. It was insane. It was just crazy. I've, I've never seen someone that would commit, you know, particularly as a teenager, she would sacrifice a lot time with her friends, you know, the usual teenage stuff that probably all of us were doing, she wasn't doing to commit to sport. I have a lot of faith in what I do and I know that I train very hard and I know what the outcome that I want is and, and I also believe anything's possible so it's just a matter of setting your mind to it and achieving what you believe in. To the Commonwealth Games now and Australia has maintained its position on top of the medal tally. Yana Pittman led the charge with victory in the 400 metres hurdles. And Pittman's away, and the 19-year-old's going to win brilliantly. She came out of Manchester in 2002 as a bona fide Olympic hope two years later and a, a big, big star within Australian athletics. Throw out your legs. Five down, <laughs> ten down, stop. The event of 400 metres is an event that the human body's not made for. That was only 15 seconds. The 400 metres is like a sprinter's marathon, and it, it hurts so much. The dream to win an Olympic gold medal for me dominated everything. Last one, let's hold 13s, come on. My social life, my every waking moment. Keep them up, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. In fact, that it became... Uh, an obsession rather than a passion. And I think once you sort of step into that obsession, it can almost be a little bit dangerous. The Olympic Games was her one and only dream. She virtually had to be stopped from working too hard. If anything, she uh, wanted to train harder than what was required. Australian Athletics has a new golden girl after Jana Pittman's world championship victory in the 400 metre hurdles in Paris. When you win the world championship a year out from the Olympic Games, you take on the role of favourite. So Jana suddenly became a very big name in Australia with all the expectation that we might have another track and field Olympic champion just four years after Cathy Freeman. To get out there this young in, in my career certainly looks like I'm going to have a reasonable future. Little did I know that my life was going to change because all of a sudden you're in the spotlight. And that is a big, big step for a young athlete to take. I really struggled, I think, with the whole attention. Part of me loved it, and the other part of me didn't know how to handle it. So I didn't know how to say the right things. I didn't know when to say no to interviews. We certainly have never pushed down. Quite the opposite, I would say. Wouldn't you say, Anna? Definitely. Mm. Yeah, you probably would have preferred me to be a doctor than be an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe Dad. <laughs> Initially, she was the golden girl. You know, when she was still up and coming, she didn't put a foot wrong. In the lead-up to the Athens Olympics in 2004, I was very confident she was going to win the Games. She was basically running within two-tenths of the world record. So she was in massive shape. We genuinely thought we were going to break the world record and bring home a gold. So we were warming up for this big race, the last race before the Olympic Games, and my right knee just popped out of nowhere. I was just doing a drill that I do every day, and I heard a big popping noise, and I think everyone thought I hit the hurdle, but I didn't hit the hurdle, it was my knee. It's almost at that moment I instantly knew that it was over for that year. 
I'm almost resigned to the fact that I won't be running at the Olympics. You know, people have asked me if I was to lose the Olympics, how would I be? And I said my world would fall apart, let alone not even running. I would have been happy as long as I was standing on the dais with a gold medal and it's not going to happen, maybe. And that's the hardest part. She was quickly admitted for surgery to assess the full extent of damage to a torn cartilage. I went to the orthopaedic surgeon and his quote still rings in my mind now. He said, Phil, I am 99% certain she's 100% finished. We got this amazing phone call from a surgeon in the UK who said, come to the UK and we think we can fix you. So it was a bit of a lifeline, a bit of a miracle. One of the things I do wholeheartedly wish I could take back was when I came out of the hospital after that surgery and threw my crutches away. Uh, I saw that as a moment of showing Aussie strength, of showing, look what we can do. I, I told you I had to stay positive, so look, we're going to have a good shot now. I've got 60% chance that I'll be running. Looking back on it, I can see how dramatic that would have looked, and it just fueled the whole Yana drama. You know, actually, I think that's actually where it started. From that moment onwards, I got labelled as being dramatic. When all I wanted to show you was that we can be heroes for our country. Yana Pittman's dramatic bid for Olympic gold ended this morning in the final of the 400 metre hurdles. She went out impressively enough to be amongst the leaders at the 200 metre mark, but then she faltered, fading to finish fifth. For Yana to finish fifth in Athens with all the drama of the fortnight before, this was somebody that was far from fit. It's one of the bravest things I've seen at any Olympic Games that I've been to. She was devastated. All her life she's dreamed to be Olympic champion. I had a lot of tears and they did not stop for a good couple of hours and unfortunately we didn't know that there was cameras over the fence. People obviously looked at that moment and thought that I was being, I guess, um, disrespectful. The moment she lost, what they say lost the Olympics, the media saw it as she failed. We felt that the media turned around and we're, we're finding ways to criticise her, you know, criticise her for crying and being upset at not winning. We were chased in cars by media. And I guess that was the first time that I started to think, hey, it's not what I thought. Uh, I wanted my daughter to be uh, involved in. I genuinely think in that moment on my reputation had been torn to shreds. And then I got back to Australia and I had no idea till that moment how much of an explosion of Yana drama had happened back home. We did a parade. They definitely had people in the crowd call out um, things to me when I was walking um, and there was the one particular guy who came up and spat at my feet and basically said I was a disgrace to the nation which you can imagine I'm 21 at this stage and I had no idea what it was what had happened but I can tell you it hurt at the time. Oh yeah look <laughs> she sometimes blames me for naming her Yana because it rhymes with drama but you know she didn't generate the drama and she was just young, that's all. Particularly between 2004 to 2007, they were highly critical of her personal life. You know, there was a lot of criticism around her relationship with other athletes. There was rumours that she was not going to run for Australia anymore, which was just absurd. Yeah, I think people would say led to a profile that, that ultimately was quite polarising. She's not somebody that came across as warm and fuzzy, therefore she probably didn't draw the same affection that a lot of athletes have over the years. I, I think in retrospect it probably was a mistake being so open and wearing my heart on my sleeve so much. Uh, it, is, it is who I am and I still do it <laughs> now, but it, it definitely was... I could have been more private and more reserved and I would probably had a, a different career pathway. 
I felt like it made a real difference in 2006 when I won the gold at the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne. It was a perfectly run race using the turn as a catapult for a game's record time in a friendly environment. And an amazing year because then I married my coach Chris Rawlinson and we actually fell pregnant with our first child. And then I won the World Championships the following year. You know, realistically I've been given thousands of gold medals in the birth of my son and to think that I've been rewarded with this too is someone smiling down on me. I'm a very lucky lady. So looking at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, she was our big chance. And here we are, not far out from the Olympic Games, a, a friend of mine who was uh, well connected rang me from Europe to say, Macca, she's out. And I knew exactly who she meant. Yet again, bomb, bomb, more injuries. So it's definitely, I guess, the story of my career. I was an incredibly injury prone athlete. And I think it's partly because I am six foot tall and I'm an 80 kilo woman, which is actually not great for athletics. For her, it was, as it turned out, I guess, um, a sporting tragedy because it was the last chance that she had to really make her mark at the Olympic Games. I think that was the start of the unravelling of my sports career. So there were many years where I hated the drama and the emotion that was attached to, the, to my name. People hate me, so it has to be me that's at fault. I have to fundamentally change who I am. And I can honestly say at that point, I decided I would not be emotional, I would not be dramatic, would never cry again. And I stuck to that for, for about eight years. And funnily enough, I never won races very much again. I was miserable <laughs> and I was cardboard. I wasn't real, I wasn't authentic. When my marriage fell apart. I definitely struggled with, with some eating issues through that period. And I honestly lost who I was. It took me a long time though to actually appreciate rather than hate the drama side of me and it's definitely something I can use as a positive. I decided to throw myself into everything that could be humanly possibly amazing and uh, it was actually my mother who suggested, well you've always wanted to be a doctor, why don't you apply for medical school? And I sat the entrance exam to get into medicine, failed the first time, but I tried again the next year and the day I received that email saying, congratulations, you've got into medical school, I bawled my eyes out. I cried for all the years and all the failures and everything I'd done not well in life. And I remember going upstairs and looking in the mirror and going, you're okay, Yana, you've done a good job. As fate would have it, we found ourselves at medical school together in the same year. When you're actually doing your uterine transplant... An athlete becoming a doctor is more common than we realise. And I think that's because the discipline that's required for medicine is very similar to the discipline that's required to be an elite athlete. Is then associated with any other marker of well-being. I feel incredibly grateful being an athlete with something that they love as much, if not more, than their previous sports. I know a lot of my friends post-sport really struggle in that in that area. What an ideal world. But I wasn't long into medical school when that lure of the Olympic Games came back and I got the invitation to join the Australian women's bobsled team. The bobsled invitation came about from an athlete I used to run against when I was a kid. We used to train together and she was looking for someone to push her. She was the pilot. Bye. The first time I got into bobsled, it was the scariest, most crazy thing I've ever done in my life. And uh, I remember holding on really, really tight when you're supposed to be relaxed and just hitting the walls and coming out and feeling like I was gonna vomit at the bottom and thinking, I'm never ever doing that again. It was awful. <laughs> But I saw potentially Bob said a different sport as a second opportunity to enjoy an Olympic Games and maybe even an outside chance of a medal. She becomes the first Australian woman to compete at both a Summer and Winter Olympic Games. You know, it was an historic achievement. She couldn't win, but did that matter? Our bobsled team, we came 14th, but in all truth, I, I often don't even remember what we came because it was about being there and I knew it was my last Olympics. It was just great to be at Olympic Games, to enjoy the experience and, and to savour the moment rather than just be under pressure. It's great to be here at Blacktown Hospital and to welcome uh, 54 of the 1,027 new interns that have come into our hospitals right across New South Wales today. The day I graduated and they announced you as Dr Pittman as you walk across the stage was one of the highlights of my career and I felt finally like I was on 
100% on the right trajectory in, in my life to be able to be a doctor for the rest of this, you know, this hopefully 40, 50 years on this planet. Um, we're very proud as coming in interns for New South Wales Health. We've been working very hard over the last few years. I know we'll serve our university and our state proud. One of her goals was to win the university medal for medicine. And I think that was a big driver. Maybe it was the medal she never was able to win it at the Olympics, I don't know, but um, she was able to get that one at least. She graduated with honours and was the ducks of our cohort. She called me up and she said, Phil, I can finally let go the fact that I didn't win the Olympic gold medal. I'm now a doctor. It's the only thing that could give me my release and I feel I can now let go. I'm a resident doctor at Blacktown Hospital, so we do rotate through different departments. To have that chance to sit with someone and learn their life and actually contribute to trying to make their life better is, is I don't think you can match that in anything else you could do. Hi Cassandra, my name's Yana, I'm one of the doctors in the antenatal clinic. Um, I think you're 29 weeks pregnant today? Yeah. When I meet my patients, I just say, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm Yana, or I'm Dr Yana. Uh, I don't often say Pippin because I want them to know that I'm there as their doctor and I don't want it to ever be about me, it's about them. So at the, tw at the 38 weeks, we'll just chuck an FHBA1C on there as well. That's just a long-term marker of sugars in the blood. I have been asked on numerous occasions as we were leaving the ward, Joe, is that the Yana Pittman, the runner? And I would say yes, and then it would come down to eventually, do you think she would mind signing something for me? So... Do you know if it's a boy or a girl? Or? I know, we don't do that kind of thing. It's a secret? Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> I think people are a little bit surprised when they meet Yana in person. <laughs> Good, that's excellent. When we see her in her athletic career, she's very driven, she's very focused, steel face, and it's in complete contrast to the way that Yana is as a doctor. Medicine got very real for me when I had a cancer scare and I became the patient. I was diagnosed with SIN3, which is basically one step away from cervical cancer and certainly needed treatment. So yes, here I am on the other end of the scale because today I had to have part of my cervix removed in a LETS procedure after a positive cervical screening test a few weeks ago and a colposcopy that showed high-grade dysplasia. So yes, I'm very nervous about it. And it was a pretty scary moment thinking that, you know, you might have cancer and have a child at home. I already knew I wanted to have more children, but this cervical cancer scare really made me think I need to do it now because the chances are treatment down the track, if needed, would mean I could lose my uterus and it could affect me having more children. So all of a sudden I was there, a single mum of one already, and I thought, why not look at the options of having children on my own? This one? No, this one's right. Cool. I actually went home to speak to my mum about the option of using an anonymous sperm donor. Well, that's what you always say, Yana. It was a hard dilemma for us to sit down with, with Yana about whether or not it was a good idea to have a child by a donor. We had lots of chats, didn't we, about it? And whether you could cope being a single mum and raising the kids on your own, because let's be honest, it's hard. We decided with her together we were in this together, that it was a good idea. You know, I, I didn't want you to miss out on, on having children, and Cornelius was so much on his own, he really missed it. Well, I was eight or nine at the time, and um, I definitely, at that point, I was quite lonely-ish, so I really wanted to um, have another sibling, and I guess you could say I, w I would have wanted it to come earlier not wait that nine months. <laughs> we actually went and looked at the donor list together and we actually selected who we thought would be a good match for, for what we look like so that the children would resemble each other. And a bit down the track, my daughter Emily was born and it went so well and I loved it so much, I thought, why not have another one? And thankfully, the next time we tried, along came Jemima. So I used the same donor as with Emily, so Emily and Jemima are full blood siblings. The girls will definitely have the option down the track to contact their donor and get to know who he is. And I'm very, very grateful to that man for, for donating his sperm. Having had my own scare with cancer and gynae cancer and also having had beautiful children myself through reproductive medicine, it was a light bulb moment to think this is where I want to take the rest of my career in medicine, to work in women's health and particularly in gynaecology. I think for her it's all about empowering women 
and allowing them to step forward and take care of their own health. Big jump. <laughs> and she's managed to do that here in Australia, but also overseas. Yana became the ambassador for the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation and both of us went on a trip to the Philippines to raise awareness over there and perform some cervical screening testing in very low socioeconomic populations. A lot of these women had never seen a doctor, let alone had a gynaecology exam. Not there were moments where I was in tears because I knew the news I was giving to this woman, who is often a mother of many children, would very un unlikely see the end of the year or at least the next couple of years because the cancer was already so advanced. This is a columnar papillion which is starting to become squamous. It was personal and emotional for Yana because she had been through the same thing herself. And she was seeing women who had not had access to the test that she herself had had. OK, ladies, I'm really grateful for you coming and sharing your story here today. I also had the opportunity to actually meet a group of women who'd survived cervical cancer. I really never had any idea about cervical cancer, pap smear, nothing. I don't want my two daughters to die also of cervical cancer. Uh, I really left the Philippines thinking with a little bit more funding and more opportunity, we could eradicate cervical cancer worldwide and these communities wouldn't be losing the women who they depend on so greatly. Core, cool. hold this one up. All right, ready? I'll take the other one. So it's school holidays at the moment. We're supposed to be out camping somewhere in Australia, but obviously because of the COVID lockdown, we decided to have a camping in the backyard. Well done, darling. It was certainly a surprise thinking I'd finished my family and I had my three beautiful children to then meet someone wonderful who actually still wanted to have more kids. Whack, whack. Watch mummy's fingers. Mummy can't lose her fingers. So now I've been married for just about a year and we have a beautiful little boy together and uh, it, I couldn't be happier. Are ready? Fire up the barbecue. Oh, I hadn't had a dad for a long time before Paul. And when Paul came along, it was kind of like oh, I've mined on. into a treasure. OK, good. Perfect. Since he's uh, married my mum, he's always been there to help me and everything's going uh, very well. I have led a very busy life working as a corporate lawyer. This is a skill I learnt not while writing opinions at work. Some would say that having an instantaneous family and all those responsibilities dropped in your lap could be a bit of a shock. Not, not with Yana. I just describe it as something that was natural and wonderful. Hello! Hi, guys! There's actually another twist to my journey into reproductive medicine, and it's one that most people don't know about, but because I had a wonderful person donate sperm for my daughters, I really wanted to pay it forward for someone else. They've missed you quite a lot, actually. We were unable to have a child because I'm in a, in a same-sex relationship with my partner. I can't see Uncle Brad. Can I please see? <laughs> Brad is one of my best friends. He started as my massage therapist, would you believe, when I was a teenager. Can't wait for you to come and visit. Yana came up to visit us in late 2018. And while we were out to dinner, she just dropped a bombshell on us. She said, I want to know if you want to have a family and I want to give you some eggs. Well, you could have picked my jaw up off the floor. I'm like, are you for real? And when you said, I'd like to offer you some eggs, and I said, We've got chickens. <laughs> we fertilised one of Yana's eggs via IVF and uh, we met a surrogate who offered to carry for us. Fast forward to the 5th of November 2019 and our beautiful daughter was born. Uh, Emmy's blowing your kisses, Marley. So I'm known to Marley as Auntie Yana. I'm obviously her biological parent and we see each other COVID pending as often as possible. And to think that I have the opportunity to be involved in their family, we call it our rainbow family, is, is quite a privilege. Next in the driver's seat is the only female recruit left on the course, doctor and dual Olympian, Yana Pickman. Recently, I was on SAS Australia. It was a really amazing opportunity to go and test yourself physically, mentally. What's happening, Taylor? We're going to go. What's going? 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 What's
it does feel like a lot of the things that happened when I was younger have turned completely the opposite. I've had nothing but beautiful, positive responses from SAS. For me, being a doctor is like my new Olympics because the adrenaline's through the roof, the pressure's there, your abilities are on the line. You need to not make a mistake. Beautiful heartbeat. My longer term plan is to become an obstetrician and gynaecologist and work in women's health. Beautiful sound, isn't it? I think it's really changed her. She's gone from, to some extent, loving the limelight to now being more dedicated to giving back to others. The Yana I know now is a much happier, more content Yana than the Yana I knew when we were both competing. And I think that's just by virtue of her having found her place in the world. So I guess medicine for me is my final hurdle. It's been an incredible journey already and I really can't wait to see where the future and what, you know, what hurdles are left to jump. I actually found out I was pregnant with the twins by ultrasounding myself. I wish I could tell what they were, whether they were boys or girls. I'm nervous. <laughs> um, I'm really excited about having the twins and I regularly check in on them on the ultrasound machine, which is really lucky obviously because I have one at work, but I basically check that the little heart rates are going well and that they're moving around and kicking around, so it's a little bit of an insight I get to have as a doctor. And soon I'm going to have six children, so it's certainly going to be a busy household next year. Thank you.